no variables, no decelerations there. So twin A, if you get your little graph out and you look at that, go through your go through your little monitor circles. For it to be, well, we know that twin A is not normal. It doesn't have moderate variability. So it's probably indeterminate unless it's abnormal. So if it's abnormal, it needs to have absent variability, which it doesn't. Um, it's hard to see there, but um, I'll just tell you, and on the test, you can, you can tell they're not, they're, they're pretty good quality. So it's, it's um, minimal variability. So if it's abnormal, it has to have absent variability in, in, some, in D cells. And so twin A is indeterminate, category 2. Twin B needs to be have moderate variability, which it does. The baseline has to be normal, which it does. It, it cannot have any decelerations, which it, it does not. It's You can kind of tell on that one, but just because of the quality and looking at it on video. So twin A is category 2, and twin B, I think you could probably tell because it's normal, it's category 1. So the answer there after all of that is C. Another strip to look at. Make sure you can see. All right. Woman presents to OB triage via ambulance at 33 weeks after a motor vehicle accident 35 minutes ago. She was restrained with a seat belt and her airbag deployed. Vital signs, pulse 110, respiration is 22, blood pressure 108 over 60, temps 99. When they check her, she's long, thick, and closed and no bleeding. Based on her history and above tracing, the most important initial assessment would be to rule out and I certainly remember that I think there was this exact question on there. Um, and the, the idea here is the clue that they're giving you is, is saying based on the history, um, even though she's only 33 weeks. So based on the history, the most important initial assessment to rule out is, um, well, not, not head injuries because that's not what the test is focusing on it's the obstetrical portion so preterm labor could be an answer but they're looking for a placental abruption because of the history of the injury and things like that so that is the answer is a for this one all right this is boring stuff i'm telling you <laughs> i hope you guys aren't dying here okay let's talk about instrumentation um We have two methods of, of monitoring fetal heart rate. You can use a Doppler. The Doppler uses um, ultrasound technology to um, detect fetal heart movement and then computes it into a heart rate. The fetal scalp electrode is a direct measurement of the heart rate. Uterine activity, you guys know this. The TOCO is an external pressure sensitive thing. Um, and they include palpation in there, and that's always important um, when you're charting. And I'll get another little plug in here. Even if you have an I, IUPC in, you need to you need to chart that you've done some hands-on palpation, because your your instrumentation is only as good as you know technology, and technology is not without fail. So your hands should go in and be feeling on that woman's abdomen, even with an internal monitor. So toco palpation, that's an external and internal pressure catheter, measures the actual pressure inside the uterus in millimeters of mercury. Okay. I kind of talked about this. The uh, uh, ultrasound compares successive reflective waveforms at many points, meaning it, um, it, there's a little computer in there that averages the heart rate every few seconds. So it detects the, the Doppler detects the motion of the baby's heart and then converts it to a heart rate. The fetal scalp electrode converts the 
fetal ECG to fetal heart rate by measuring consecutive R to R uh, wave intervals. And ding, 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 I think there was a question about that. The scalp electrode measures R to R wave intervals. So I would remember that. Um, the TOCO detects changes in uterine wall shape, and we know that that can be influenced by movement and position and people's hands that push on it that want you to think they're contracting when they don't, when they're not. And IUPC measures hydrostatic pressure within the uterus. Um, and, and you know from practice also that there are things that can influence that, so it's not perfect either. It is somewhat positional. Um, there's been times I swore it was underneath the baby's armpit or something because it just was not working the way it was supposed to be. So, old-timey auscultation. Um, you know, it doesn't happen very often, but if you have an arrhythmia, um, it's not a bad idea, and, and sometimes if you have a nice sensitive stethoscope, you can hear a heart rate with a stethoscope. So um, if, if you think that there's anything going on, generally we rely on ultrasound and stuff like that, but you can always try to grab um, a stethoscope and listen. And then we also have, you know, handheld Dopplers. All right, fetal arrhythmias. The definition is any irregularity of fetal cardiac rhythm or any regular rhythm that remains outside the general range of 100 to 160. And that's a pretty old definition from 2004. Um, arrhythmias are not associated with uterine contractions, so there's no periodic sort of changes that happen when there's contractions. And um, that doesn't include periodic fetal heart rate decelerations. Here are the types of fetal arrhythmias. You have an irregular rhythm, which looks like that scribble up there where it's back and forth and back and forth. And you can get that off and on. You can get a long run of it, get little pieces of it. Those are PACs and PVCs. They're in, intermittent extrasystoles, like an ectopic, an extra beat, or a skipped beat. And you probably have heard that in your rooms when you're, you hear the skipped beats, where it goes, it goes, um, you know, click, 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 and then a skipped one. Um, the tachyarrhythmias, like the supraventricular tachycardia, the ST, S, SVT, um, can be benign, um, but it does warrant some evaluation. You can also get atrial flutter. And also I wanted to point out, and I kind of like skipped over that, um, the irregular rhythms, those are 85% of your rhythms. Your tachyarrhythmias, like your SVTs, are a smaller portion. And then sometimes you get bradyarrhythmias too. Um, complete or um, third degree atrial ventricular block and we just don't really run into those very much. If you get a patient maybe that has lupus or something and they haven't had great prenatal care, um, then you can, you can get some of those um, Brady arrhythmias like that. All right. This is probably one of the um, irregular, regular, irregular, regular um, rhythms that you see that are the biggest um, portion of your arrhythmia types. The PAC or the PVC, the skipped beats, and, and I say that because it can't, it can barely register. You know what I mean? It, it might have skipped beats, so you get two beats and then it skips, and two beats and then it skips, and you can actually hear those. And those are tough to trace. You get all this chicken scratch like this when you have a rhythm like that. And here's one that actually is able to trace pretty well. Um, You have some uh, PACs, some ectopic or skipped beats, 
and the monitor just makes that dark slashing trace on there. Here's another tracing with lots and lots of it. Um, the premature ventricular contractions, the ectopic or skipped beats. And it's just a solid line of scribble um, where the monitor is making that mark. It can't um, like connect the dots. Here's one that's scary. It's the same strip that we had um, in, in the other, the second review where there's supraventricular tachycardia and it's just so high that it's almost off the paper the monitor can't even trace it um, and it can be sustained and it can be runs of it because I've had patients where it was normal and then it would switch over to SVT and it'd be a way up and then it'd go back so again it, it needs evaluation you need to put on your pulse ox to see if that's what you're actually picking up and um, it could be only a half rate that's recording twice, so you need to go through that process of troubleshooting your monitor. If you have sustained SVT, um, your babies can't tolerate that for very long. Um, and there's times you would maybe have to um, transfer that patient. So what you would want to know about that for the test is what is the therapy for SVT. Um, if you have sustained SVT, you can get fetal high drops. And there is a high mortality if it's untreated. They get congestive heart failure. Their little hearts just give out. Um, what is the best treatment is a bit controversial. So, and that's beyond, I mean, our scope of practice. They would have to go to Spectrum and, and, and be evaluated for that. Um, but they usually would um, give them Digox and, and, and do some, um, some drugs that would help um, cardiovert that baby's heart, and that would be beyond what we would do. But again, what you'll need to know for the test is what the treatment usually is for that. Here's an ultrasound of a baby that's got some fetal high drops, and just you can kind of tell a little bit it's not the best picture but they're just that watery puffy you know like they have fluid everywhere because they get edema because their hearts cannot keep up so SBT um, risk of fetal high drops and, and, and uh, heart failure and then um, they would have to the providers would have to decide if they're going to um, do some drug uh, cardioversion with those babies. Here's a picture of um, a complete or third degree heart block and we talked about that when if a patient has lupus then their the electrical connections in the heart don't form completely right. So 50% of those are associated with congenital heart disease like transposition is the great vessels um, 50% are associated with maternal antibodies. So some of those um, could be a diabetic mom because that's another risk for diabetic moms is heart, heart problems for the baby, heart um, congenital heart defects. And then with lupus, like I said, um, the circulating antibodies that the mom have um, attack the um, electrical conduction pathways in the heart. So I guess this is just to illustrate um, how this baby's heart is working with the, with the reverse flow and stuff. It's not that much that you need to know this, but um, know what this looks like. But you'll want to know that if you have a patient with lupus, that that is a chance and how that works, that they can have a heart block because of the defect in the electrical conduction of the heart. Treatment for those babies is to plant a pacemaker. So that's again beyond our scope of care that if that patient 
was a, had a known problem, they, would, they wouldn't deliver here, but if something, if that, that came up, then you would make every effort to transfer out that patient so they can be at a facility that give the baby the care that it would need. Okay, artifact versus arrhythmia. Generally, if, if you have areas where it's uniform, meaning it's like a colored in area, see how that is, and that is, and that is right there, and that is right there, that is an arrhythmia. If they're excursions that go up and down every which way, all kind of randomly like here, that is artifact. So for the test, because I can guarantee you there's going to be one on there, they show you a strip that it's a nice little uniform block of scribble in there like these. That's an artifact. I mean, that's, that's an arrhythmia, but if they go up and they shoot down and they're all over randomly, up and down like this, that is artifact. And you usually see that with an internal monitor. Sometimes if it's on a, not a great spot on the head, or if it's rubbing against the cervix or something, it's kind of on the edge of where the, you know, edge of dilatation is, you can see that a lot. You get artifact like that. So... That is one that you'll need to know for the test. I remember there being a couple of those. Okay, an example question. If you're using a Doppler to determine fetal heart rate, autocorrelation does what? Analyzes the strength of cardiac contractions, compares successive reflected ultrasound waveforms at many points, and measures and averages two to three fetal R to R intervals. Well, if you're using a Doppler, it's external. So we know it's not C because C is internal, internal, you know, FSEs. They measure the R to R intervals. intervals. Um, there isn't anything that analyzes the strength of cardiac contractions in the baby. Um, besides some sort of targeted ultrasound maybe where they did a, a um, Doppler flow. So the only thing it can be here, because it's an external and it's Doppler, it compares successive reflected ultrasound waveforms at many points. So your answer there is B. Okay. Now, don't let this one trick you up because there's actually a couple things going on here. Um, this tracing asks, is this artifact, fetal arrhythmia, or seizure? So look at what you have for most of it. Um, and you have those really darkly shaded areas here, right here, right here, right here, all of these here. And so most of what you have going on there looks like arrhythmia. But what else do you see? Do you think that there's probably some artifact there? Yes, there is. There is some artifact here and there. But overall, when you're looking at it, um, the, you're looking at that arrhythmia because you have big sections of that. And, and there was something very similar to this on the test, and I think they'll probably stick with something like this also. Um, and seizure, I mean, they, I guess they had to throw that in. But, I mean, if you didn't know, it could trick you, uh, slip you up, and you might think it was a seizure. Okay, one more example question. All right, sustained supraventricular tachycardia, SVT, increases the fetal risk for congenitive heart failure, neonatal pacemaker, or polycythemia. Okay, so polycythemia is when the babies have um, a lot of cells, a lot of red cells. So that doesn't have anything to do with that one. So you can eliminate that one. And when you're taking the test, it's kind of like boards too. Like I said, you process of elimination, you try to go through them and eliminate the ones that you're sure are not right. We talked about neonatal pacemaker, but that was in the case where you had um, a heart block. 
there was some damage to the heart or a congenital defect. So there was an SVT involved with the neonatal pacemaker, so it's not that one. Um, but if 